lockdown, circuit breaker, and lockdown again. So yeah, we're all trying to make sure that the business continuity is in place while working. We're we are working. Everything's different. Yeah. So yeah. So today, you know, we just thought we'll have a lighter, you know, a non-tech topic, uh, especially for all our, uh, you know, customers who are outside India. You know, help them understand uh, some of the culture traits um, from uh, you know on how to work with uh, remote teams in India. You know, whether they want to outsource or whether they want to have an in-house setup. You know, how to do that. Uh, so that's the whole objective. Um, ready for that, Aditi? Everyone? Absolutely. Yeah. Let's go. Okay. Great. So this is just uh, some of our clients. We, we skip this salesy slide, but yeah, spend the next uh, 20 minutes or so uh, understanding some of the uh, unique cultural traits as well as focus on uh, you know some form of Q and A after that, uh, and then if, if there's a need, then you can go to roundtable for one-to-one -one, uh, discussions. So sure, yeah. So this, uh, you know, let, let's start with understanding the fact that what are the core centers. So when you talk, when we talk about tech, right, uh, Aditi and everyone, I think these are the seven uh, core centers across India. What what do you guys think about this? I think, uh, I mean, absolutely. I think if, if I'm looking at your slide, uh, absolutely. In terms of uh, core centers and understanding geographically, I think this lays out quite an information. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, this this pretty much I covers mean, the memory centers. Yes. Yeah, but I'm, I'm, yeah, there, there are some you know so-called second tier further cities as well, like you know Ahmedabad, Jaipur, uh, some of right. the other uh, cities. But I think they've not been traditionally known. So we are looking at at least places which have minimum fifty thousand engineers. Uh, so even places mm -hmm. like Nagpur, etc., for example, have less than 10,000. Uh, so I think all these centers are places where you have more than uh, 50,000 uh, people in that employed in the technology and in the IT mm -hmm. sector. Uh, but, but I think there is this general, general discussion about North India, South India, right? You often talk about, okay, we are North Indians and we are South Indians. Right. So okay, do you see any business-wise cultural differences in the way say people from northern India would behave versus people from southern India? Uh, one of the things uh, there's one thing to note, Sid, I've, I've, from the experiences I've gathered, I've seen that people from the southern states uh, generally a little, uh, uh, they tend to be a little more educated. Uh, and, uh, and and I don't take this seriously when it comes to uh, having deadlines, professionalism. So I think uh, it's all rooted in their deep culture. So you're talking about South India, is it? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Okay. So you're more for you 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 have a higher <laughs> rating for uh, our southern state. Uh... <laughs> I, I have a rating, uh, sort of like an equal rating with South Indian as well as East East. Uh, East. Okay. Bengal, especially, of course, uh, Bengal producing uh, the largest community of engineers in the East, of course. Right. What about you, uh, Nirvan? What What is your take on this? Uh, I think what's been point. I mean, I think it's it boils down to a cultural aspect. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, can I be heard? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Hmm. Okay. So I think it boils down to a cultural aspect because the north of India traditionally has been. Uh, a uh, more uh, warlike when it comes to a uh, cultural element of it so that aggression that uh, that aggression comes through even when they work in play so i think that aspect of it kind of appeals to our more western countries where that aggression is is seen as a part and parcel of the way they work whereas the southern and eastern uh, states which have always had a more agricultural tradition rather than a more warrior traditions where patience and 
a slightly slower pace and more detail oriented aspects are are more appreciated so uh, both have their actually appeals because i believe that um, especially with, with with an american audience they relate more to the north indian culture because uh, culturally they are more similar whereas uh, the the way of working is more and, and and with the north indian there's an element of okay let's get it done let's move 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 whereas with the uh, southern and eastern there's more okay let's stop let's test let's do it twice thrice and then let's move on and i think both have their uh, both are important i mean both uh, are required for a proper balanced approach to to working I agree with you, Anirban. I think that's a very valid point because each geography has its own uh, pros and cons, right? So I'm sure when we look at it culturally, uh, I think each region has its uh, own advantage and disadvantages. So if you are talking about Bombay region, people are people, they don't sleep. They have a 24/7 culture, so they're always on the go, trying to get things done. So absolutely, I mean each yeah. each region would ha would have its own advantages. So. Okay, sure. Yeah, yeah, but definitely, I think our, you know, uh, colleagues and co-citizens or uh, residents from southern India, we definitely find that, at least, uh, uh, you know, overtly, they seem to have more patience, and and slightly softer in their etiquette when it comes to business etiquette. So yeah, that, that's I think one key takeaway for our uh, people who've uh, joined today. The second is, of course, you know, when you talk about uh, language and accents, uh, I think one key takeaway here is that uh, one thing that's probably a, uh, a residual effect of the colonial rule is the fact that though we have so many languages and 29 languages, uh, I think English is predominantly the core business language when it comes to, uh, you know, not at a retail level, but when you come at an office level, especially the IT and tech level, English is uh, definitely uh, the predominant language. Uh, but again, I think what we see here is that, uh, you know, again, the accents are quite different. So uh, I don't know what your views are about accents in Southern India versus Northern India. Uh, any thoughts on that, uh, guys? I think that accents being different is something that is a part and parcel of a global way of working, very frankly. I mean, an Australian accent, I mean, uh, I struggle to understand a very British accent, but because of thanks to Hollywood, uh, an American accent sounds so much more natural to my ears. And uh, an Australian accent, I mean, I understand large parts of it, but then there are parts that I don't. Uh, Eastern Europe has a variety of accents, I mean, and even if you go to the UK, I mean, uh, a, a Cockney accent is very different from the, the very polished BBC accent. So uh, I, think that, <laughs> I think that having a varied accent is, I mean, something that um, it's a reality of the way uh, of, of, of uh, any global language would have varied. I mean, would, would have people speaking, making it their own. I mean, we have a large Singapore audience and and our Singapore clients have, a, have what is officially called Singlish. So Singlish is a very, very different way of speaking English. So I don't think that that uh, that, that accent is a huge, uh, huge uh, problem when it comes to uh, when it comes to working. It's just that uh, that it's something to be expected. I think it's something that uh, the business community expects and. Uh, Yes, perhaps some accents are easier for them because I, I believe that a Bengali accent is slightly more easier to accent. Uh, sorry, accent is quite easier to understand because it's slightly more neutral than for a Southern Indian uh, accent, English uh, accent. But I believe that it's not a huge, uh, as long as people expect it, and like everybody expects it, it's not a huge uh, obstruction. Yeah, I think I think it's fair to say uh, that you know for for people who are looking at India in terms of at least language accents, they don't need to first of all worry about uh, the regional languages because I think most businesses, especially at the IT level, is done in English. Uh, but I think it's definitely there that the southern accents are stronger than the northern accent. I think, for example, you know the our the, the accent in which we are speaking can be 
loosely classified as northern indian accent or northern eastern sort of indian accent and the southern accent sometimes can be very strong in fact i struggle sometimes to understand when when they are talking really strongly um, so it's just something that you have to get used to it as i said accent is only one person's view about the other person right for for you sure. the other person has an accent and for that person you have an accent exactly. uh, like like for example with the with the american media the way it's grown uh, you know of course that seems like the default accent to most people who have never been to europe for example and even if you go to england today if you go to parts of scotland um, you'll struggle to understand what what, what exactly are the same uh, so i think accents are very relative I just uh, a very interesting observation on that is that actually I was watching uh, you know there's that uh, that show called The Office it has uh, it's an interesting setting in accents because The Office has a UK version and a US version and at least in the yeah. first season a lot of the dialogue was exactly the same like exactly mm -hmm. the same dialogue so I had watched the first few episodes of the American version and then I was mm -hmm. looking at I was uh, watching the British version yesterday and I had trouble understanding the words even though i mean the language is british it's their language but somehow the american accent is so much more understandable to our ears yeah it's predominantly probably because of the fact that of the media being so strong you know hmm. all the movies that you see and all the western movies and sitcoms and it's you see your music that you hear is is american music you do hear british as well but then that's limited and again even talking about singapore you know a guest from singapore uh you know sometimes that the singlish accent can be really strong uh, and it can make you listen to it twice so again accent is a very variable thing for for people wanting to do business in india yeah i think the good good news is that uh, the english is very much uh, a native language perhaps from a business perspective uh, it's just that the accents vary and the southern is the strongest and as you go further north uh, it's uh, more neutralized i would say Yeah. Okay. So, so this is something. Uh, what we're trying to discuss is that, uh, you know, how confrontational Indians are. You know, like for example, do they, especially when we're talking with respect to the tech sector. So, if if you say something and they don't agree with, do they confront right away, uh, or will they say, "Let me see," or will they take the time and come back and say yes or no? Uh, so it's it's trying to compare with the japanese culture where we've noticed that in japan they don't instantly give a response right if there is a if there is an alternate view then then they would wait and give the response so what do you guys think about how the confrontation index it probably ties into the first point that we discussed about north india south india and east india but but you know for example if a if a if a west if a customer from the us is trying to do business with india and he says something that the team members don't agree what do you think is the default response or the or the expected way of things the way it would happen uh, not just in a small to medium company but also a large company i think um, i'm pretty sure you guys would want me to answer that question because i'm talking to so many people throughout the day so in generally what we see in in us what happens is if they do not uh, agree to a particular respect they have a very uh, i wouldn't call it impolite but a very um, clear and um, uh, formative way of putting it out that uh, you know this is what we think and this is this is an understanding of, of the matter so i don't i wouldn't call that being uh, rude or uh, aggressive but i think they are very clear on what they want they're very they're very specific about their requirements and they make sure that what they think is put out to the table uh, exactly in the format that they want that's that's uh, the us part would uh, would be and uh, if i talk about uk uh, or european audience they generally have uh a uh, very, very um straight view of putting across what they need so there are certain levels of disagreements that that may happen but uh, i think uh, as indian audience we are trained to understand various cultural differences and uh, as a marketer or as a sales person we have to understand that not uh, not every client is the same and not every geography would behave in the same manner so i think cultural confrontation uh, in terms of 
US or UK is quite different from Singapore also. Uh, in in Singapore region, what uh, from my personal experience, I think uh, generally they do not answer. They they sometimes are quiet. They sometimes get back on email when they have a different opinion. That's that's my view. On one, I think uh, you'd be a better person to comment on the Singapore market. Uh, in the way you read about uh, Singapore, the Singapore audience, where uh, rather than saying, okay, this is not uh, good, or I don't agree, they would, uh, there's, a, there's a, 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 a culture of maybe keeping a little more quiet. Uh, but I think that's also common with India. That's kind of common with us. It's it's part of the Eastern culture. To I think it's more to do with the Asian culture. Yeah. With the Asian culture, and I think there's a because I I I, I kind of talk. I have, I have friends uh, in the Americas, and I have uh, colleagues, and I, I also go on a lot of forums, online discussions about work culture, and uh, this is a cause for for some level of uh, misunderstanding, which is why it's good this point is being addressed because. What happens is that I've seen in cases where where an American person, he's probably, I mean, they get they get frustrated because they're like, okay, I just said this, but uh, but uh, he later, I mean, my Indian colleague, he later told me that okay, that was not a good idea. So I asked him, why didn't you tell me then, in the meeting? And uh, they are probably reticent to air it out in public or say no, that is probably not a good idea. So this habit of saying no or uh, is seen as rude. Whereas in the American culture, boardroom culture, it's not a rude thing, it's just an opinion. So you have a different opinion, I have a different opinion, fine, we can have different opinions. But uh, this is something I believe that it kind of, it, it's, it's, a mis, it, it's a problem of expectations. The expectation is that if you disagree, you'll say no. And here the expectation is that uh, if I say no, it's a rude, it's rude. Yeah. So, this is this can be a cause un, unless there is proper communication and understanding. So, so I think uh, you know for for our viewers again, if if any of the attendees wish to make a point, please feel free to put it on the chat. It's available on the right hand side uh, of your screen. But um, I think I think based on our experience for for people outside India, uh, I think it's fair to say that. On a call, if you if you raise a confrontational point, uh, you know, other than a few cities, you are unlikely to get an instant response. Uh, you're 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 probably likely to, for them to say, okay, let us look at it and we'll come back. And uh, I'm talking about a business situation here, uh, whereas we know that in the U.S., if if it's very clear to to them that it's not agreeable, then they would instantly say, no, this is not acceptable. Um, I think in the UK again, uh, you you probably have a similar response to India, but it would be further. Uh, it might lead you to believe that they have agreed to your proposal uh, of going the other way, and but but they will think back and come back with their with their views. I think in India, you are really to get an instant confrontation, uh, especially I'm talking about the tech sector and a project management kind of a structure. So that's that's the expected behavior. So interesting. Let's move on. Yeah, working hours. So, so I think this is this is predominantly also related to the uh, the fact that uh, you know I think Asia in general has much longer working hours. Um, I mean, Japan is uh, totally infamous for that. Uh, in fact, they are struggling with this uh, work working from home because uh, apparently the homes there are not structured to work. And they and and they are probably smaller than uh, most homes expected in in a developed uh, country or so-called developed country, and they are really struggling to work from home because their homes were not just set up. Um, I think in, in India as well, what we've seen is that especially in the tech sector, uh, yes, definitely working long hours is uh, is become the normal. Uh, and and the thing is that they are typically adapting to the market they're serving. So if they're working with Japanese or Singapore clients, they're coming in early. If they're working with US clients, then they are starting late and then there's, they're staying on late. Uh, so this is something that's uh, uh, that sometimes, uh, like when you get a customer who says, oh, we are in Holland or we are in UK or we are in New York and we'll have so much of uh, overlap time. But 
practically speaking, you will get much more as an overlap time. Um, so I think that that's a good part, and that's probably essential, especially when a sector is essentially export led. I think it's essential for a country to align from a working hours perspective, where necessary, of course. So if it's a BPO, KPO, then they are 100% aligned. But if it's a software company or a digital creative company, then they're aligned to the point that when the meetings are necessary or or, or the catch-ups are necessary. Otherwise, they're working during the day. So other than this point, uh, Nirban Aditi, have you seen any variation to this, like especially working in India? Do you see any variation to what I said? A little bit of a detail that I would say is and something that's been pointed out in the slide as well, that uh, perhaps uh, Indians work longer hours, we work longer hours, but we also take slightly longer breaks in between. So our coffee breaks tend to last a little longer, our, uh, our lunches uh, last a little longer. I'm not saying that's universally true, but uh, that's kind of, and, and I think that's a direct result of what you said, working with a lot of international clients. So uh, the, the reality of, uh, of working in a global environment is that I may have, I may be working with a, a Singapore client in the morning and then I have, may have a meeting with a US client in the evening. So uh, instead of having a very rigid start stop time to working, it's more like I organize my work day and my, uh, my leisure according to the, the, the requirements made for me. So, uh, so I think that's the, 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 the more detailed aspect of the way we work. OK, yeah, fair enough. Uh, Aditi, how are we doing with time? Uh, do we, are we doing I think well? we have uh, another five minutes uh, and then 10 minutes for Q&A. So I think, yeah, another 10 minutes would be good. Yeah. Right. So this is something that, uh, you know, one of our is more for recommendation. That you know the fact that if you are trying to work with an Indian firm, uh, of course it means remote working. Now remote is now very fashionable and standard today, uh, but in general, when you're working remote with any team, I think one of our recommendations is that uh, you know try to work with uh, one step when people are qualified for one step higher, uh, and that sort of hedges your fact of the communication and other things remote. What I'm saying is that if someone needs to be of a five-year experience to do something, have someone with six years experience, right? If someone needs to be three years experience, then four years experience. If someone needs to be a B-Tech, then you'd be better off having an N-Tech, right? So th this is what we mean that you can hedge your remote with higher skills. Of course, it's going to cost you a bit more, but I think the productivity gain will actually help you in offsetting the uh, fact that you're working remote. Uh, so that that's one strategy. Um, any 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 thoughts on that, uh, Anirban? Uh, no, that's kind of that kind of covers it. Where uh, I mean, uh, that there's this this uh, this element of uh, gaining new skills uh, and and uh, uh, coming home with a broader set of skills, and that's assumed when it comes to uh, a, a more Indian working setup. So I think that's what pretty much covered it. Uh, yeah, so that you're muted. OK, sorry. So yeah, experientially talking, you know, this is this is again, um, because I this, think yeah, you, had to, you had to get a golf reference <laughs> in, didn't you? <laughs> yeah, comes his favorite. So the mulligan is, is for people who don't play golf uh, or do not follow golf. Mulligan is essentially giving another chance. Uh, you know, you get and you forget about the first shot. So that's considered as if you never took that, and you get a you get a you get a chance again. And what I've seen is that for many countries, uh, especially um, so as you go west, say when talking about German or even UK or or even, uh, you know, uh, parts of the U.S. When 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 they're, they're laying down a plan, essentially the expectation is everything to go right the first time, and that's the reason they would invest time in a plan. So if you said, okay, I need this to be done, and uh, you know, you would explain what you need, 
And it's almost expected that this is how it should come back the first time. Now, partly because of the fact that it's remote uh, and partly because of just uh, natural reasons. I think, I think the fact that if you can keep the patients that, okay, for some times I need to, per person, I need to have, you need to give them, a, allocate them, say, one or two mulligans a month. That, okay, I'm going to allocate this task and he's going to come back, he or she's going to come back with something that's not acceptable. I have to explain it again and then it will be acceptable. But if you lose your if you lose your trust or your patience from the first time, then you are missing out on the fact that the second time they could have done a good job. And uh, you know, some people might say you need to do it with anybody every time. But I think as you're working across continents, across time zones, across cultures, I think this really one round of feedback or budgeting for one round of feedback really adds value. Um, so, yeah, any additional notes on that, Aditi and Irvan would be great. Not really. I think this is an extension. I think this is an extension of what we talked about earlier when it comes to the language, uh, where um, while a lot of us speak English, a lot of Indians do speak English. The the context, sometimes context and cultural clues are kind of. Uh, missed so uh, so somebody who lives abroad some somebody uh, in america or england might be using phrases or expressions that might not be universal and they may not realize that that's the case so uh, i mean you sometimes not always need a one round revision just to sort of i think it's less a case of uh, not really doing the job properly and more a case of a lack of understanding of what the person means when a person says something so that one round review is done to say okay i said this so you did this or rather you said this so i did this but this is what i actually meant so that's what the one round of feedback is necessary for and what happens is that after you work with a, a say the same set of people for for a year, which is why I mean, there's always that advantage of having your same partner for years, which is that you start understanding each other uh, first across language and boundaries, and then even across body language, where it becomes so familiar that you, I mean, we have clients like that where it, it doesn't matter what I mean, their expressions are so familiar to us that now we know what they are saying, even when they they are not directly saying it. So yeah, during the initial period, yeah, give them a mulligan, give them a mulligan. Aditi, any thoughts? Yeah, I think I, I would agree with only one because a lot has to do with the uh, misunderstandings that come in play when you're dealing with uh, various cultures together. So absolutely, when uh, at the beginning of a journey, I think uh, uh, this concept is really, uh, it resonates, yeah, I agree. OK, cool. So one round of feedback is absolutely needed, absolutely needed. Sure. So this one, I think, uh, is more of a misconception because, I, and again, this is what I've seen, like, especially when you talk about the tech sector and working with India, I don't see, I mean, people assume that Namaste is the default. I mean, this is, again, I'm talking about pre-COVID times, but but how many times do you go to a, a, a software company or a hardware company or a tech company and, and do Namaste? Have you ever seen somebody doing Namaste in, in, in your career? No, no, absolutely not. Being being uh, at the forefront of client interaction, being a client-facing person all my life, I have never gone to a client's office and said namaste that way. It's always been a handshake and a very firm one at that. I think namaste is a kind of reserve for uh, cultural and uh, social gatherings more yeah. than anything yeah. else. That too, not with very close people, but with acquaintances. Yeah. 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 So, so this is again, because we, you you definitely find the classic way of when when someone from overseas or from 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 US or, or Europe or Singapore they come to India and they try and sort of gel in, and when they come to the office they do namaste. I don't think people find it uh, uh, endearing. I don't think people actually smile that okay he is making an effort to gel in. But the fact is nobody does namaste till now. So now in this portion <laughs> in the pandemic world, um, I think um, I think even then, for some reason, even though Namaste is such a good 
uh, gesture, uh, even even from a health perspective, the fact that you're folding hands and closing the circuit of your body and letting the energy flow. Um, I don't see a 25 year old person or a 30 year old person uh, in, a, in, a, in the tech industry ever doing namaste. I think they would just simply say hello. They would do an elbow bump uh, in this post COVID world or they would just wave their hand. Um, you know, it's just that it, it's like how the politicians, for example, they wear uh, the, the topi and, and the kurta pajama on a daily basis. But we, when you go to the offices, you, you don't see even one person doing that uh, generally. And unless it's, a, unless it's a very traditional shop in a traditional area of a city, you rarely get to see that, that uh, people are wearing traditional clothes in day to day. So I think Namaste is a great uh, invention. Uh, in this new pandemic world, you're probably going to see that, uh, but we don't really see them. Uh, yeah, uh, you don't really see that uh, in in a, in a in a tech, especially in the tech industry and sort of more uh, services oriented industries like telecom and BFSI and all that. Yeah. So these are just tips, you know. If a lot of our viewers who are coming from you know first time to India, trying to understand India. It, it, it will help you clarify that uh, right now the hello is good. And I think this is uh, the head nod. So I will let you guys speak on this. Uh, uh, this is... Um, this is exactly this what is, we do. Yeah. Like we're yeah. doing on this webinar as well. <laughs> and, uh, and you don't... It's not universal. I, I assumed always that it was a universal thing, but... Uh, in, in fact, even the head nod is different in different parts of India because in, in the in the eastern uh, side of uh, in the western side of India, there, there's this this head nod which means no, which is not something that is part of this part of the country. So, and then there's the universal head nod where you nod your head for an yes. So yeah. So South Indians, what they do is they nod their head this way, but they mean a yes. Uh, yeah, that, that, okay. that's that also. No, but yeah, so I think uh, one way to understand this is that I, I have always seen at least the head nod more like, you know, when you press a form button, right? And it asks you, are you sure? Yes or no? So I think people say, are you sure? You know, it's like, are you sure? It's like, uh, you know, it's a soft landing. And the other yeah. person says, yeah, yeah, I'm sure. Yeah, yeah, I'm sure. Yeah. So I'm, I'm, I'm trying to emulate that right now. So it's it's a soft landing. It might seem strange, but then, you know, culture is like that. Every country has its culture. Different, uh, I think there is nothing. You know, I, I remember when I first went to the UK, somebody asked me, um, will, if we go to India, will we get a culture shock? I said, you know, it, it works both. You know, it, it works both ways. Uh, I think both both parties can get a culture shock. This is definitely one culture that is not apparent, but uh, yeah, in the South, especially, it, it's also like la, like in, in Singapore, uh, you know, colloquially they use la. Uh, so will this happen la? You know, will this happen? You know, that's one one way of talking. It's a will this happen la, which means it's a, it's a softening. It's like a fabric softener if you like. It's a fabric softener. So I think I call it the fabric softener. You know, when you shake your head and you're asking for confirmation, is it okay? Huh? It will be okay. It's like a fabric softener versus I'm saying, will it be okay? Will it be okay? Huh? So it's a fabric softener, I think. And the other person also says, yeah, yeah, it will be okay. So he's responding quietly. So I think it's, I, I personally, I call it like a fabric softener. Uh, yeah. But it can mean different things to different people for sure. So I think we're coming to the. So this is again very unique to India, which a um, lot of uh, you know the Western culture probably doesn't understand that uh, you know, people do stay with their parents uh, not all the time because they have to, but because that's the culture, uh, and and they're also very. Uh, open about talking about the family structure. So, for example, in, in resumes that we see in the West, they never talk about whether they are married or not, whether they have children or not. They never talk about those kind of things on their resume. In fact, in many countries, it's illegal to ask about those things. 
especially in some European countries or most of the European countries. And in India, you will, if you go to Nokri.com and just scan 10 resumes, you know, Nokri.com, by the way, is just a portal like Monster.com in the US. Uh, you know, people openly talk about and put in their family data in their resume. So uh, people are more open about talking about their uh, uh, family structure and and just the way it is, uh, you know, people. Yeah, so if so, for example, it's, it's it would not be cool for you to say, "Oh, you're still living with your parents." You know, that's not the way it works in India, because that's you know that's that's not abnormal. Uh, versus in the U.S., okay, if you're 30 years old and living with your parents or whatever, 40 years old, they say, "Oh, wow, you're still living with your parents." It doesn't work like that here. So uh, probably more of an HR tip. Uh, any thoughts? Uh, uh, and, uh, another thing I would add is that probably the family commitments. I mean, uh, it might seem a little odd that uh, I mean, someone might say that okay, I'm, I'm I have a cousin's uh, wedding, uh, which probably in the Indian context would probably be a lot more pressing a family engagement than uh, than it would mean in a Western context. I mean, a cousin's wedding might be actually a wedding with someone you live with uh, and you see every day. So. Uh, there's that, that that adjustment that needs to be made in uh, the mental sphere. Uh, you're muted, I think. Sorry, uh, this is another, another thing, you know, I personally face uh, and I see, for example, both of you are managers and I'm sure that you have some people who call you, might call you sir, and some people might call you the first name. And I've often thought whether I should enforce one way or the other. And I, I just thought that personally, I thought let it flow because whatever works for whoever, you know, let's not dictate. Uh, it's not common in the West for sure. Um, you know, calling by first name is usual. But the thing is that we have to understand that, especially in India, People come from different uh, cultural backgrounds, and uh, for them, uh, often the the way you speak uh, or the way you address somebody is also a big part of how you think about the person or your respect. For example, if somebody is coming from a you know because it's 1.3 billion people, right? Not everyone lives in Mumbai Kaf Parade or Bandra, right? Uh, it is. It is a different uh, structure. So, so if you force people, for example, if I were to send out, I often feel like saying that, okay, you know, everybody to call me by my first name. And I think it might be okay for some of the direct reports, but for someone who just joined as, as a 22 year old, for example, might feel uh, confused because he's not done that. So yeah, any any interesting experiences on that, Nirvan or Diti? I think I'll agree to the second point that uh, it's a mix. I think second and third points. I think it's always a mix of uh, that happening with uh, some some people calling by the first name, some people calling by a sir or a ma'am. I think it's always a mix, especially with the Asian. I wouldn't say Asian. I think I think it's more on in India. Uh, I don't think it happens in Singapore or in Japan or in uh, any of the uh, Southeast Asian countries. Yeah, I think that's a remnant of the remnant of the British. Uh, yeah, yes. I would have to agree with that. Yeah. You, uh, I mean, that's one thing which we, we kind of remember the British than uh, perhaps the Americans. Uh, I mean, that's a culturally backed up by them. And I think that's another aspect of that because most of us are bilingual. So, I mean, uh, when we are speaking our native tongues, we have a different way of addressing our bosses. I mean, uh, uh, and then when it when we shift to English, it's, it's, uh, it's, it can get a little confusing. So sometimes some people uh, use uh, and sometimes some people use the first name basis. It depends on where you're coming from, really, I believe. And also, I think about the uh, way the company is structured. So if you're working from home yeah. or where you're working in the office, it also depends on the unique... Um, uh, cultural, uh, you know, mix up of the company, the brand of the company, and the way they have these employee relations, right? For example, if you look at startups, 
they do not they have a strict no boss policy so if you go to oyo or as other startup you know people, you know companies who have a very linear policy they do not have uh, uh, you know that uh, structure of having a ma'am or a sir okay it's, it's like okay, you have to call the ceo also by the first that's how it is. i think it's also got to do with the company yeah 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 but i think largely it's uh, let's say if, if it transgresses from little bit from the business culture to personal culture like if i say my habit i my my guitar teacher for example since i was in grade 9 or uh, even for example you know the gent who's the uh, head of jdbi not jd who was the head of jdbi now heritage aditi you might remember him so, dr mukhopadhyay so, yes yeah so you know like that several examples when i address him i don't feel comfortable addressing yeah. them by their first name i would feel very very uncomfortable even though i've had a equal flavor of the west and the east uh, in terms of having connections or talking etc or living whatever but i still address i would never go back to my guitar teacher i was just saying sir you know sir and say hey tapas you know he'll be you know that will be like you know that's just not going to happen similarly when i write emails to him uh, you know i just say hello sir it was good thank you for inviting me and there are several people like that and and i think even when you translate to non english we if you talk about bengali we are using phrases like dada uh, we are if you talk about uh, you know uh, hindi for example we use bhaiya which is yeah. uh, what in brother and this is not calling your bhaiya bhaiya not your brother as brother like even for example uh, when i see uh, like this you know, the broker who you know you know some vendors for example who might be significantly younger their addresses can i call you bhaiya you know so i think it's is literally to do with that the fact that recognition of uh, age i would say more than and respect all all of that uh, sometimes it's a position but it's something that's probably not going to go away soon uh, india as a whole uh, it will reduce of course over the next 100 years uh, as as the millennials are coming in but it's not going to go away in the next few decades i think uh, but but essentially the message to all our uh, friends uh, from uh, coming from outside india is that do not be alarmed when you see that oh you know this, this, what is this sir what's going on you know it's just the way it is yeah that's the way it is yeah so i think um, we yeah, have the time to get so we we'll have to yeah absolutely so so thanks everybody so we just a few thing about web spiders you know web spiders this is our 20th year and uh, we we are a firm based uh, based in multiple countries uh, new york in us uh, london singapore and in india we have two centers in calcutta and bangalore uh, and largely we we are a boutique software company so we focus on uh, solutions like for example sales development automation so we have a product called zoe that helps you automate lead prospecting then we have a uh, tool called zoe for customer service automation you know that's used by for example more than 17 malls in europe are using out of which about 14 malls i think are in uk are using the zoe product then we have several large event companies and education companies in us who are using our product so it's really a very a chatbot that gives you over 90% accuracy in understanding human language and in fact we are going to have a dedicated webinar about how zoe is able to cross the 90% threshold we have the entire services unit that's doing low code rapid apps development so like in singapore we we work with pub which is the public you know the water body regulatory uh, all their public facing and internal apps are being three of their apps are being have been done by us then we develop apps for multiple people uh, so we have, we have a very large, large app development team e2m our flagship product so from a services you know right now we we are a leader in offering virtual training and virtual events in fact this platform that you are seeing right now is being powered by e2m uh, so really proud of that and you can go to e2m's website e2m.live just by clicking on this uh, logo on the top left 
I'm booking a meeting if you want a private demo. And, uh, you know, an advanced team does a lot of content production and management. Anirban, any two words, quick words on this? Uh, I see uh, we, our content production is, uh, the, the good thing about our content production is all it's, uh, we actually, we have video, audio, uh, content, graphics, pretty much we have the full capability to produce 360 degree content marketing services for any brand, any industry, completely in-house. So there is all, there is no third parties when you're dealing with web spiders, when you are working with web spiders on any content related project or any project that has even a element of content in it, you're only working with web spiders. There is no freelancer, there is no third party involved. Uh, so, uh, and our expertise uh, is throughout. I mean, we have designated video editors, we have audio engineers, we have uh, uh, designated content writers, SEO professionals, uh, social media uh, experts. So, um, if you're working as, and, and when you work with us, you get a single point of contact and pretty much all your queries are handled by that one person. So uh, the whole point is to reduce headache as much as possible. And uh, that's, that's the focus. I mean, um, I mean, the, the, the old saying is that uh, content is king and, and uh, we have the full quote. Uh, Great. Thanks for that. Yeah. And, and then and then finally, you know, in part of a services unit, you know, we are one of the largest, I think, most accomplished Drupal agency. Uh, you know, Drupal, as you know, is not only used for CMS, but it's now an application development platform. You know, some of the largest applications are being built with Drupal as a base. Uh, and we're going to do a dedicated webinar of how we can accomplish that. Uh, so it's really something spectacular. Uh, and some of the largest, I mean, we are doing work for portals that, that are doing, say, about 12 billion pounds a year in revenue. And the gateway sites are in Drupal. Similarly, some of the largest projects, and we'll discuss more about it, are in Drupal. Uh, Web Spiders is powering that. So with that, uh, you know, I'd like to thank our attendees. And what I would like to encourage is for attendees to join us on a roundtable. So if you just click on the roundtable icon, uh, on the gateway side that you had, uh, and it will help you. And you know, we can have a five-minute chat on, on what your thoughts are about about the cultural differences, and and uh, you know, we could take it from there. So, if you if you could just join us by clicking on the tab of round tables, uh, you'll see a hangout, and you just click on that, and we'd love to see you there, chat with you for a few minutes, and uh, wish you stay healthy and look forward to catching up with you again. Please join us in the round table. Uh, you can see it next to the conference uh, element. Uh, so see you soon on the round table. Uh, thank you. Thank you, sir. Thanks, Amir. Thanks.